Well, this is uh, the subject today. You know, we've been been going through um, the follow me statements in Matthew. And as we go through them, remember, we had the, the four fishermen that left their boats and followed. The next Sunday, we had the scribe who uh, Jesus kind of said, you know, you don't really know what you're asking to follow me. And the guy that, you know, Jesus said, uh, let the dead bury their dead. And he kind of, you know, rearranged their expectations a little bit. And last week, we had the call of Matthew and, you know, how scandalous that was for uh, Jesus to call a tax collector. And this week, as we've kind of tipped our hat to, we're, we're, we've got this, this point where Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is difficult. This is not, I think we kind of, you know, handle that real easily sometimes. We've heard it so much, but it's really a very difficult statement from Jesus. And I, when we were working on this, I, I thought about the time when Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. And uh, I think what he means by that is that most of us want to follow, but we may not actually follow through to be chosen. And the chosen are the ones that follow through to do it. And, I mean, it's, it's just a difficult thing. So today's call from Jesus is perhaps the, the hardest thing that he says to anybody. And it's probably almost the, the most important, too, because there's some truth in here about life that uh, we shouldn't miss just in the difficult statement. So I want to set this up for us a little bit. Um, this happens in Matthew 16. If some of you want to turn there and kind of follow along, that's cool. We'll, we'll have, the, of course, everything on the screen. But Jesus and his 12 disciples are up at Caesarea Philippi. And this is like uh, where, where he has this great statement that's by Peter. And Peter, you know, has this breakthrough. And Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And people give some different things. And, and uh, then... <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I'm so sorry. I can't get. We're so small. We're so small. You know. Okay. All right. Here we go. So we're we're up at Caesarea Philippi. That's so ga- That was so gathering nice. You know. That, that, it's great. It's great. All right. So they're up at Caesarea Philippi. Edit that out of the of the video, would you? Somebody. They're they're up at Caesarea Philippi, and. Um, Peter has this breakthrough. Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And they, some different answers. And, and Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of living God. And Jesus says, you've got it. I mean, he's the Messiah. He's the son of living God. We call that the, the good confession. And uh, it's a wonderful moment. And Jesus says, okay, you're no longer Peter. Now you're rock. And, you know, I'm, I just see Peter just, you know, his chest just, well, I'm rock now, you know, and then, and then Jesus says, and I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. And so, you know, yeah, shaking the keys of the kingdom, takes them off his belt and gives them to, to Peter metaphorically. And, you know, Peter is just, you know, this is everything. It's this big moment. So what do they do? I mean, what would we do in a moment like that? We'd shoot a selfie, right? And so they shoot this selfie. I don't know if you've ever seen this or not. Um, here we go. I think it's there. <laughs> yeah. They have the selfie made because we want to remember this time up here at Caesarea Philippi. And that's Matthew right there, kind of uh, right of middle. He's hold, actually holding his gospel, you know, like he travels with this thing with it. That's how you can tell in these old icons. That's John next to him. He's got his gospel too. This is probably Peter to the left of Matthew. But, you know, this is this huge moment. And, I mean... Before, maybe they thought he was a teacher, he was a prophet, but now he's the son of God. He's the Messiah. And they understand what God was really doing. But it goes south from there. You know this story. I mean, at this moment, they finally understand who he really was. And Jesus reveals his plan to them as to how he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer at the hands of the Jews. And he's going to be killed and then he's going to rise again. And, and Peter, with the keys still kind of hanging there on his belt, he, he says, well, now that I'm kind of in here, uh, let me 
tell you a different plan, Jesus, because I don't think this is really a very good uh, a plan for you. So uh, he informs Jesus that this isn't good at all to suffer and die. And Jesus comes back with this passage. So here we are, Matthew 16, 24 to 26. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Now, I think first we have to realize that what Jesus is saying is different than what we normally hear this. I mean, he's talking about a cross. And we've got, you know, we've got a cross in our communion table. Nowhere would, no way would they have had a cross anywhere uh, as an ornament in their, in their room. So we've got a wall of crosses over here. You know, the cross means to us forgiveness. It's, it's that symbol of God's grace and forgiveness. But to them, when someone said cross, it meant torture. It meant pain. It meant shame. And that's what Jesus is telling them. He's not talking about forgiveness. He's not talking about grace. He's saying, deny yourself, pick up your instrument of torture and pain, and come die with me in Jerusalem. That's what he's saying to his 12 disciples. Shouldn't miss that. And the events unfold, we see that at least um, some of them said that they were willing to do just that. Uh, Peter, uh, later on, um, asked Jesus, he says in, in, in John chapter 13, he asked Jesus, where are you going? Because Jesus is saying he's going to go suffer and die. And Peter says, I will follow with you. I will go all the way. If, if need be, Jesus, I will suffer with you. And then we know how that turns out. Because, you know, Peter doesn't make it. He denies him three times. None of them make it. They all think, we can do it. We can go to Jerusalem. We can go with him and suffer and die. And they can't do it. They run. They flee. So when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, he's speaking to them about a literal cross. He's, he's calling them to sacrifice their physical lives. Now, I think in reality, um, I don't want to speak for you, but I know that I would, just, I would just suggest that the call to give up our physical lives and martyrdom to God is a bit of a stretch for us. I mean, as a matter of fact, if we say, oh, I'm willing to go die with him, we probably really don't know what we're talking about. Because, you see, we're not being, we're, that, that's not the, the test for us today here in America. None of us are, are being persecuted with, other than ridicule. But it's not, we're not worried about having to die with Jesus. So for us to say, well, I'd go die with him is really just, you know, it's hypothetical. And we just don't know, you know, if we could do that or not. And we say, oh, Lord, I'll follow you to the end. But in truth, we, we don't know what the end is. So, so we can't promise to do that based on some hypothetical situation. It's kind of empty. But, but look again at verse 25 and 26. It says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Jesus is giving them a teaching about really about life and about death, about discipleship. It, it applies to them. Uh, it applies to everyone. In fact, he gives us really kind of the secret to life in this passage. He says, deny yourself and you'll find life. That's what he says. Or to turn it around and put it in the negative, he says, live for yourself and you will experience death because you'll never have life. If you go through life just living for yourself, you'll never really live. And that's the truth that's under this call of Jesus to the disciples to follow him to Jerusalem and die there on the cross. And the truth applies really to every person, whether we're facing persecution or not. This is the truth of life, that if we give ourselves away, that we'll find life. And it's, you know, at first reading, it just kind of sounds wrong. It falls kind of hard on our ears. I'm supposed to lose my life, okay, in, in order to find it. I'm supposed to go against my own wants and my own desires and my own dreams, and that's going to give me life. And, I mean, this doesn't taste 
real nice at the beginning. It doesn't digest real well. You know, I'm going to lose to get something. I mean, is this just more religious kind of philosophical talk that we do, you know, that doesn't really have any meaning for us? And the world system says, no, you, 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 you know, What's in you, just go for what you want. You alone can tell yourself what you need, what you want. So just live for yourself. You can't live for anybody else. It's just up to you. You know, uh, deny yourself, you lose your life, and you'll find life. Uh, that's, that's not right, the world system says. I think of George Costanza. You remember George Costanza off of Seinfeld, some of you oldies? Probably the character on TV that was the most selfish, self-centered guy. I mean, we always feel better about ourselves after seeing George because we thought, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as George, so I'm probably okay. But there was a time, there was one episode where he comes into that coffee shop and, and uh, Jerry and Elaine are there. And he tells him, he says, life just isn't working. He says, my entire life has turned out to be just the opposite of what I wanted. And so Jerry has this idea. He says, well, then why don't you just stop doing the opposite thing of what you think you, that you want to do and see how it turns out? And George says, I'll do that. And so he goes out and, you know, everything instead of lying is his natural thing to do. He starts telling the truth. Instead of lusting after women and treating them like objects, he, he starts respecting them. And his parents, instead of, you know, just di you know, he dissed his parents constantly, he starts respecting his parents. And, you know, he starts to show self-control instead of going into a rage when he's driving, all these different things. He just does what's unnatural to him, what is not his first instinct, and it starts working. It changes his whole life, just doing the opposite. And in the process, he gets a new job, he gets a new girlfriend, he's got better relationships with his family and some self-respect. And in essence, George kind of, you know, lost his old life and got a new... It's a really a very religious show. Stop and think about it. He just does what is the opposite of what he thinks he should be doing. Now, I know it's, a, it's just a silly TV show, but... It's, it's really just what Jesus is saying. If we want to be Christ followers, we have to see life as he, as he sees it and, and live life as he lived it. And that means a life of denying ourselves. It, it means a life of putting God's mission, God's values before our own interest. And strangely, when we do that, we find life. Remember, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it abundantly. He said that there in John 10, 10. And, and Jesus serves as this life giver, showing what it is. And he says, deny yourself. I, I see the contrast really kind of being like between giving and, and hoarding. Um, we can follow Jesus and believe that what he says about giving our life away, or we can just try to kind of hoard life like uh, people hoard possessions. I really can't watch that TV show. You watch Hoarders ever? That show just gives me the willies. These people that got all that junk in their house and just, you know, little trails of stuff to get through. Uh, I can't remember who I was with. It was with somebody in the church or not. But a couple years ago, we went to somebody's house and they were hoarders. And they just had, because we were getting some furniture for somebody. I'm just getting too old. I can't remember. But, but they had little trails through their living room and through their kitchen. And they had stuff that piled up like this some of it still in the boxes that it came from the, the the store in and all this stuff that they'd never even opened up and it was like oh this is so you know it just makes me sick I just eh, get me out of here not just that it's dirty but they just got all this stuff you know and I'm, and Jesus says what would you give in exchange for your soul there was a a Simpson episode where Homer traded his soul to the devil for a donut. <laughs> Sounds like Homer, doesn't it? Right? Trade his soul, he wanted a donut so bad. He traded it away for a donut. Yeah, some of us are going, oh, I don't know, you know, a dozen? Uh, you know. <laughs> but stop and think about it. What do we gain if we hold a grudge for 20 years? Don't even get a donut for it. Right? We just, you just have the grudge. That, that's all that it's worth. Or what, what profit is it if we hoard our time? Or what do we gain if we, if we, we hoard bitterness or prejudice or fear? I mean, 
actually Homer looks kind of smart. At least he got a donut out of it. You know, he traded something for something. Jesus says, give your life away and you'll find it. But if you hold on to your life, if you hoard your life, you're never really going to have it. If we say, it's my time, those, this is, these are my possessions, this is my money, we're going to be so obsessed with owning it that we never get to enjoy it. It's it just lost on us. We never find life. And Jesus says, deny the right to run your own lives. Live uh, like I live. Give your life away. And then you'll find out what life really is. I suppose we should have a basketball illustration. Right? I mean, it's only fitting. And it works this year. Because uh, those of you that are UK fans and follow it, um, you know, which is 99.5% of you guys probably, um, this was a team, and each person on this team uh, was living for himself. He was thinking about the NBA, thinking about the end of the season, thinking about what's my press, and, you know, until they finally just, it just crashed until they were doing so poorly that they almost had no other option but to start to play for the team. I mean, that's just a real simple analysis, but that's really kind of what's happened this year. These boys finally just gave up and said, okay, I'm going to start, start playing together. I'm going to start stop thinking about the NBA. They kind of gave their lives away to the team, and they found out what it's all about. I, I think it fits a lot of different places in life. You know, according to Gallup, happiness is at a high, highest rate it's ever been in America, four-year high. Sixty percent of all Americans today feel happy. Uh, a new study, though, that, that they did cautions that there's uh, something much more important than happiness, and we know what that is. That's finding meaning. That's finding purpose in life. They interviewed 400 Americans. A study found that two categories overlap, happiness and purpose. There's one major difference. Happiness focuses on taking and purpose focuses on giving. And the researchers concluded that happiness is about feeling good and happy people tend to think that life is easy and, and when they're, they're happy when they're in good physical health and they're able to buy things that they need and want. And the pursuit of happiness is associated with being a taker, really. And the study stated, if anything, pure happiness is linked to not helping others. In contrast, they said, people living, leading meaningful lives get a lot of joy from giving to others. Uh, having more meaning in life was associated with activities like buying presents for others, taking care of kids, serving others. People whose lives have high levels of meaning help others even when it comes at the expense of happiness. So, I mean, like, what's our most important goal in life? Is it having purpose and meaning, or is it being happy? If it's being happy, we'll look at taking. If it's, you know, purpose and meaning, then we'll look at giving, which is what Jesus is saying, deny yourself. Really, it's a matter of life and death. The reality is that the self doesn't die easy or quickly. We follow Jesus on a path. We don't take a pill. It's not instantaneous, this cure. And we may think that we will follow anywhere and go through anything, but we don't really know until we're there. We don't really know if we'll follow him until that day comes. Um, I think of Paul. He warned the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. He says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And Paul's saying, watch out. You, you think you got it together. You think that you can follow all the way to the end. You don't know yet. Watch yourself. Don't promise more than what you can do. Don't think you're going further than you are. And we don't know the rest of the path because we've not been there. So when it comes to this denying ourselves thing, I think we should go slowly and with some humility and the reality is, is that every, every turn, every opportunity to grow and mature, to move forward, we have to give something up. We can't just take everything with us. We can't be hoarders. And the cross, I think, stands at every juncture. The, the, the cross stands for deny yourself. And the cross stands at every juncture in our life. 
What are we going to give up? What are we going to die to? What is standing in the way of us following Christ? Where do I need to die to gain life? I think we may not admit it, but I think we know what it is. I think each one of us has something that's standing in the way right now. It might be different than what was standing in your way, you know, a month or a year ago. I had a man one time tell me that he didn't want to stop doing this particular thing that he was doing, which was sinful, and he knew it. He said, because it's the one thing that I can control, and I'm out of control in everything else in my life. And I said, really? You, you don't want to do that because this one sin that you have is comfortable to you? It's familiar to you? Now, now, if any of you have ever been in any kind of you know, addiction therapy, you know what this means because it does become very familiar to you, this addiction. And that's what he was saying. And so I kind of challenged him. I said, I don't really think you're in control <laughs> unless you can give it up. And, of course, he couldn't give it up. But um, he insisted that he could. He just didn't want to. Uh, I think the sin really was the master. But the cross stood there. For his advancement is, am I willing to deny myself to go forward? So what, what, where do I need to die to gain life today? What, what's standing in my way? Every place, remember, that we find life, a cross waits. Every time we want to advance, every time we want to mature, we want to grow, there's a cross there waiting for us. So I think through some different areas, you know, and this might touch on, on some of our lives. I just think broadly through some different areas. And every relationship that we have across weights there for us. Have you ever tried to get somebody to do what you wanted them to do? There's a challenge, isn't it? Even a small child. Have you ever tried to get them to do what you want them to do? Possible tasks sometimes. Uh, why can't people just do what I want them to do, you know? And... Uh, there's a cross that waits there for us. If we want the relationship to be one that has life in it, then we have to be willing to die to ourselves, to our needs, our demands, our control about how we think this person is supposed to make me feel. So, you know, your children, you have to die to the ideas of who they're going to be, who you, you want to force them into being. Um, your spouse, well, to find life. What God wants you to have, you have to give up the plan of changing your spouse into someone that's kind of made in our image. It's a rough lesson. It takes us many years sometimes. If we're worried or we're anxious, then maybe we have to kind of, you know, die to our expectations of how life is supposed to be. If I'm bitter, I have to uh, die to, you know, getting even or and find life uh, that in contentment or peace. At every place, there's a cross. And the question is, will I surrender? Or will I insist that the world must live by my plans, my dreams? No mistake here. Jesus is saying if we want to find life, we have to give our lives away. And that is done daily. It's not just one time. It's daily. Luke records the same passage, only Luke adds one word in here. Jesus says, Deny yourself daily and pick up your cross and follow me. He puts daily in. So it's not just a one-time thing, you see, but it's daily that we deny ourselves, daily that we look at the cross, pick up our cross. It's a daily exercise so that Jesus might give us his life. And it's not easy. It's a path, not an event. And God is inviting us to follow. He wants you to have life and life as the as he teaches it it only comes through death so where are you today let's let's sit sit in a moment for prayer on this and just let the lord speak to us
but the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out.